great. Thanks ever so much uh, for arranging this. Uh, it's a very hot afternoon, so I'm going to try uh, to make this not too cooling for you at the start of this. You can find out what World Map is by typing the word World Map into Google, and you'll get lots of maps. Uh, so there's no point in me telling you about that, because that's easy. What I want to tell you is, is where it actually came from, and a tiny bit about why you might want to do some of this stuff yourself. It's a mix of quantitative things. It gets quite geeky. Um, the story of how these maps are actually created gets very geeky. But it's also very qualitative, because one of the main effects of the maps and this kind of visualization is the effect it has on how people think. Um, you're using your eyes at the moment far more than your ears. Your ears are forced to listen to the drone be going on and you can't really escape that. But your eyes tell you all kinds of things. Uh, your eyes are particularly attuned to look at other human faces. So I'm acutely aware that you've got bored of that map and you no longer look at the map and you're looking at me. Uh, where we tend to look is just about this level, about two thirds of the way up. Because that's where eyes appear. And the first thing you do as a human being is you look for the eyes of the other person looking at you to check they're looking at you. And if they're not looking at you, you start to cry. And that way you get to survive. Um, and I'll show you later that there are very emotive things about these. Uh, they're called cartograms. Cartograms are distorted maps, normally by population, but can be distorted by other things. This is a cartogram of Europe. FB square there uh, is the size of the number of people living in the square. And you can see, for instance, that the UK is quite a large blob, but not a blob that the rest of Europe couldn't really live without quite happily if it had to, let's put it that way. It's a way of putting it in perspective. You can see that Scandinavia is lovely, but very small. Um, you can see that Europe is dominated by cities and certain countries are particularly dominated by their cities which turn uh, into circles. We don't fix the shapes, the shapes emerge naturally. Uh, this can cause unfortunate things. If you're getting bored at any point in this talk, log on to World Mapper and have a look at the shape of Nigeria. I'll just leave it at that. Um, you can ask me questions later if you want to know what happens to Nigeria. The colouring there, I'm not used to not doing this interactively, but they will be recorded, so I won't ask you to guess. It's coloured by a rainbow colour scheme that cartographers hate. Uh, the colouring is by when the country first entered the European Union or European community, to the most recent being red and turkey uh, on the edge of applying for membership. So that's, what, that's why they're coloured in that way. World Map began about 2004. It was an idea of this man, this man's called Mark Newman. Mark Newman is an annoyingly clever physicist. Um, Mark Newman is actually the grandson of the man who invented the computer with Turing in Manchester. He was Turing's PhD student, Mark's granddad. Mark Newman managed to solve the equations for producing the collect card. Extremely annoying because Jock has been trying since 1974 to do this and he failed. Anyway, that's what Mark did. And Mark was beginning to get inundated with requests around about 2004 to produce maps. And Mark sent me an email to say, Why don't we produce a set of maps and he can't face doing it? And so six of us came together to do it. I had never met Mark, never physically met him. Uh, we produced a book together that translated into about 20 languages. And one interesting thing about the way things work nowadays is you can do work together with never physically meeting anybody. Anna got to meet Mark, but the very first time she met him, she puked up all over him. Because she was ill and had just come off her plane to the United States. Uh, the project had almost no funding. The less funding you have, the more you tend to produce. The more funding you have, the more reports you have to fill in, 
the less you tend to produce in my experience. I'm trying to give you some things to ask questions about later. Um, that map there is the world sized a few years ago, before 2008, by those countries making a profit from financial exports. You get the idea that Britain was doing quite well from financial exports. Let's go back to Europe again. Why would you want to draw these kind of maps? If you don't draw a map like this, if you draw a normal map of Europe, there aren't any people in it. A normal map of Europe is a map of fields and mountains and remote areas with tiny dots for where people live. Here's a map of Europe stretched out and now we've shaded it and it's shaded according to the proportion of people in each area who were born in a different country to the one in which they're now living. So for much of Europe, it's that pale yellow colour. Less than 5% of people in effect are immigrants, if you want to use that word for people living in a country they weren't born in. <coughs> Most of Britain is immigrant free. Okay? All those yellow areas of Britain hardly any immigrants. Rather like Eastern Europe, not very many immigrants. London, over 20% of the population in the centre of London is immigrants. And you also get to see by the size how important that is in terms of people. And it looks impressive, but Switzerland's just as impressive. Switzerland's a weird kind of sausage shape. Um, the more stretched out you are as a place, the more migrants you'll get. Paris, doing okay, but the real place for immigrants is down in Spain. Loads of immigrants, very elderly, lots of them about to come home when they can't pay for their healthcare privately. It's going to be fun when they arrive. Um, why, why would we produce maps like this? It's trying to show what the kind of normal pattern of something is across Europe. That is where the immigrants are. Mainly in, towards the core, apart from the old expats from Britain who head towards the sun, mainly in cities. Okay, this gets more geeky now. Here's the cartogram of the south of England. All of those lines, the very faint lines, are lines of latitude and longitude. And they're all curved, because everybody gets the same amount of space. But even though they're all curved, they're all meeting at exactly 90 degrees. Okay, it's conformal. That's the clever thing. And there is a single solution that is the correct population. Can't agree. You're, you're, you may be thinking, why would you use a map like that? The obvious thing is election graphics. But you could actually just use that map if you wanted to get a map. We could put the road network on that map. All the roads would connect properly. And you wouldn't have to have a great big A to Z. In effect, you could just use that to drive between places. If you put the road network on that map, what you discover is the place with the fewest roads is London. On that map. London actually has the fewest roads per person. It's called the square root of people who want to get really weird about it. <coughs> Which is why the roads in London are full of cars. If you put railway lines on that map, you discover that they're beautifully evenly distributed. If you put trauma centres on that map, places you'll get sent if you have a serious head injury tonight, if you decide to go to the pub and don't look. If you draw a dock for each trauma centre, and you're a government policy maker, you can then decide which one you're going to close because of the cuts. Which isn't very nice, but it is a more sensible way of doing it than other ways. Or if you're Tesco's and you're interested in where you're going to cite your Tesco's, you can either believe the consultancy, they tell you they're brilliant at GIS, but you just have to believe them. Or you can plot Tesco stores on that kind of map. For the University of Oxford, we produce a similar map but only of kids who get AAA at A level. So we can look at who are the ones that we think, we, we're incapable of educating people who don't get Bs, because we're not very good. So we draw the map of who gets AAA and above. And then we discover there's loads of places where kids get AAA and they don't want to come to Oxford. But it takes out the underlying distributions that everybody says, have you taken into account that? 
There's two Brexit maps. Um, they're exciting if you draw this kind of map because most <coughs> maps, I've drawn thousands, tens of thousands of maps of Britain like this, they always all look the same. The poor areas are poor, no education, rent's lower, people die earlier, and so on and so on and so on. This map is <coughs> different. This, this map is very different, its patterns are very different. Um, what you can see for a start is that the vast majority of England and Wales was leave, shallow leave, but leave. The Remain isn't just concentrated in places like London, Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol, Cardiff, but it's much higher there. So you only get 48% Remain because the Remain is so high in Remaini places. <coughs> but you have to start with a map like that, it's pointless otherwise. There's our old map. Why did we used to have maps like that? For those who don't know, one of the original reasons is you draw a compass line on that map, and it's a straight line, and you can work where you're going. But there were also subtle psychological reasons why that map carried on being used right up into the 50s and 60s, and I think in the early 70s. That map makes Russia look really, really big. And if you want people to think Russia's big, that's the kind of map you might use. World Population Cartogram, this is the current population, about 7.4 billion. We could try and do it for all the people who've ever lived, it's a bit hard to work that one out. Um, and then the arrows on the map are estimates of when people first moved around the world for various places. So it's the beginnings of an attempt. Um, to draw a map of the movements of humanity. You can create 3D cartograms where your third dimension is time, and each of your lives is a little worm that goes through time, each having equal length. So a baby who dies on their first birthday has the same length as somebody who lives to 90, say. All these kind of things are possible. Or you can draw travel time maps where you change the surface so that the distance on it is how long it takes to get there. The travel time map of um, the UK is large for London because a lot of people, but in the morning London is a, map, is a mountain because it's hard <laughs> to get in. But it's a mountain with caves going into it, which are the intercity rail routes, and a tight road off the top, which is city airport, and so on. Nobody's done that. The number of things that are still to be drawn are extremely high. People have proved it can be done. And if any of you were to do this, and it's not that hard, mm -hmm. it's just a bit hard to explain to your friends, neighbours and relations what exactly is you're doing when you go home at Christmas. But if you do this kind of thing, people are very, very interested in things which are visual. That's the route of a single ship. It was the world's largest ship a couple of years ago. Uh, with Carly, I wrote a book called Geography, and we had seven maps of this, and I'm showing you these very, very quickly. And just give you an idea of where the ship went, around how many people. Uh, the lines on the maps are the world's major roads, submarine cables are drawn in the sea, and so on and so on. I'm used to these maps now, so I see humanity as a single set of 7.4 billion people. It's much less frightening, if you begin to see it like that. If you're sick of people, uh, this is the map of where you have to go to get furthest away from people. Uh, this is drawn by Ben Hennig, um, and he did it in a very, very calculated way. It actually takes into account going around hills and things. But anyway, Greenland's the answer. Um, in the UK, that's where you need to go to get away from people. Here's the world without oceans and seas in it, which is very different. It looks like a map of Monday. The centre of the world is in India. It moves every year, but kind of get an idea. And suddenly the UK is no longer in the centre of the world map at <coughs> the exact height you look at when you're looking for eyes. It's no accident that we drew the world maps of the UK in the bang in the middle of the centre. Suddenly the UK is a rather miserable little block on the edge of a peninsula that really shouldn't be called a continent because it's just Western Asia. It's very different. Crops. If you want to know where your breakfast cereal comes from, that's how we feed ourselves. 
organic's lovely, but most people would starve. And the speed up the earth at night. Uh, you've seen this picture before, the conventional picture, and you think you're looking at the picture that shows you where people are. You look at this picture, and of course there are people everywhere, absolutely evenly spread out. So exactly the same data suddenly no longer tells you where their people are. It tells you where there are people stupid enough to shine light up into the sky. <laughs> exactly the same data utterly changes the message. In the areas that are dark, they still have electricity now in most of those areas. They just don't shine it up into the sky at enormous cost. Rainfall, and we can animate it. You can make the map the size of the rainfall. The model looks like it's got a heartbeat as the monsoons move around the planet. I can no longer make these maps. If you're good at computing now, the bad news is you won't be good when you get to my age. It is a young person's thing. Uh, ben Hennig, there's a young Ben and an old Ben, and there's Tina in the middle. Ben Hennig now does World Mapper. That's Afghanistan. President Trump has that little map up in his office, the one with all the red, and America red means right wing, big <coughs> That's what the colour is for. So Trump has his right wing bigot map up saying, look at that, we're all red and right wing bigots. That's Mark Newman's uh, map of the vote. And of course the blue did have a majority because more people voted Democrat. Um, but it, it kind of shows you the pattern and it's visceral, it's weird, it's almost organic, it's almost like a creature. That's middle America, stretched out around the cities. Absolutely petrified of what goes on in the cities. As I said, they can have emotive effects. This is data from some time ago about who's currently suffering with HIV, and what the world distribution is. After you've got over the first impression of the map, have a look at India. You just realize how many people in India uh, have HIV and we tend not to think about it much. And finally, lastly, hopefully to time, um, the computer programs that do these are changing all the time. The latest ones were done by Michael Gaston and some of his colleagues. They were published in PNAS uh, only a few months ago. Uh, Michael Gaston was the PhD student of Mark Newman, who was the grandchild of Newman who did the computer. And what PhD students tend to do is to embarrass their supervisors by doing things much better. And what Michael Gaston has done is produce an algorithm which works 10 to 20 times faster. Once it works 10 to 20 times faster, you can do these things in real time on screen. And so you can go between normal map, population map, same election, or whatever you want. Alters all the time. And what it does is it stretches your mind. It, it makes you think in different ways. It's hard to prove this. I'm asserting it at you. Um, but it's really interesting to see. I think I'm going to do something. Has anybody ever heard of the, the Flynn effect? I'm going to end on the Flynn effect. Okay, the Flynn effect is, is the measure that IQ keeps on going up. IQ is a silly measure, but it tells you a basic thing about people's ability to do logic tests or when they're schooled how to do them. But what Flynn found was that decade after decade, IQ on average goes up remarkably. Um, such that the majority of Americans from the 1950s would be con considered imbeciles today. And that isn't because they were imbeciles in the 1950s. What has happened is that through, sc through schooling and screens, people have become more and more used to abstract thinking and to graphics. So you can do this kind of thing now, particularly with young people, which you couldn't do in the past. This is Kenston and Chelsea. Uh, those dots are all somebody who died between 2.10 and 2.14, I think. And the final one is showing you that the mortality rate at North Kensington is 20 to 30 percent above the average long before Grenfell Tower. Um, done by a set of people based in Russia and America. So that's a whistle stop tour of what is World Mapper, what is cartograms, uh, what can be done with them. There's still an enormous amount to do. It's I think still one of the most exciting areas of research and the kind of thing which we probably need to see more of is looking at clustering.
Because if you draw a dot on that map, say for every child who's stopped and searched by the police, you should get an even pattern of stop and search. And when you don't, it's not because the police are more likely to stop and search people where there are more power blocks. It's because the police are simply more likely to stop and search people there. That's my 20 minutes. Uh, thank you ever so much.